the 10 Minute of Physiologist with Dr. Michael T. Cooper, a podcast focused on engaging culture in a New Testament manner. On today's podcast, there is a movement of God in the New Testament, no doubt. It's not a church planting movement as it's understood today, it was much more significant. Now, here's Dr. Cooper with more. As church planting movements have drawn the attention of missionary practitioners around the world, missiologists are looking closely at this phenomena and asking challenging questions. In recent years, a few of those questions posed by Jackson Wu and a cadre of missiologists from the International Mission Board, as well as professors from predominantly Southern Baptist Convention seminaries, contested the methods of CPMs, including T4T and DMM, as well as called attention to an apparent biblical eisegesis as advocates were accused of reading CPM or church planting movements into the New Testament texts. Today, Mission Frontiers claims that there are more than a thousand church planting movements around the world, and CPM agencies are reporting phenomenal growth of multiplying house churches focused predominantly in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Such growth naturally draws the attention of motivated missionaries who equate numerical progression with success. Equally true is that such phenomenal reporting of growth draws attention of critics. Their criticism of CPM has generally fallen in four categories. Theological shallowness, immature leaders, reckless evangelism, and long-term sustainability. These criticisms raise supplemental questions. For example, with such an emphasis on church planting movements, is there a clear mandate for church planting in Scripture? Additionally, as these movements grow, what is their susceptibility to syncretism? Out of a deep concern for theological orthodoxy, critics has, have observed that the lack of a focus on theological education could lead CPMs to eventually adopt unorthodox beliefs and behaviors. There's little doubt that this has happened. From anecdotal evidence gathered from different parts of the world, I've personally collected reports of CPMs that have fallen into the hands of cults in both South Asia and Southeast Asia. I've heard stories of missionaries meeting with house churches long down the so-called generational map of a CPM who didn't recognize that it was even Christian. Others have assessed movements that found that they lack any recognizable ecclesiology. Outside of the theological shallowness, the critique of CPM has alleged that these movements appoint leaders who are unequipped. CPM advocates often retort that they trust the Holy Spirit to ensure the ongoing growth of leaders, in spite of the fact that Paul clearly directs Timothy to safeguard the orthodoxy of church leaders in 1 Timothy 4, 6 and 13, and again in chapter 6, verse 3. While there are certainly instances of Christian leaders disqualifying themselves, indifferent of their involvement with the CPM or not, the CPM focus on obedience can result in leaders who are driven to achieve numbers more than driven to maturing the people in their care or their own spiritual maturity. Not guarding their own spiritual maturity can and has resulted in domestic violence, extramarital affairs, and addictions. The third critique is reckless evangelism, and as the critics posit, this reduces the gospel to a simple prayer for salvation in an easy believism that stresses once saved, always saved. According to the critique, the primary concern for getting the soul into heaven seemingly disregards discipleship, which plays so prominently in the New Testament. The work of thousands of short-term mission teams, the mass evangelistic strategies of the Jesus film, along with digital evangelism, produce fantastic numbers of so-called converts who are often left on their own. Although, as mentioned, CPM advocates insist that the Holy Spirit will teach them. They're often left on their own to understand how to grow in their faith. Finally, the sustainability of church planting movements is challenged by critics. There are instances where once reported CPMs in an area can no longer be identified. While it's hopeful that some have been absorbed into the traditional churches, Others could have fallen victim to syncretism or to another non-Trinitarian form of Christianity. A deeper study and assessment of CPMs is absolutely essential in order for us to understand their long-term viability. 
perhaps God is working incredibly. And if so, an accurate, dispassionate, and objective reporting on these CPMs would cause great rejoicing and no doubt strengthen the resolve to complete the Great Commission. These four critiques were one of the primary motivations for writing Ephesiology, the Study of the Ephesian Movement. I believe God worked in fantastic ways as the Holy Spirit empowered believers in the book of Acts to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, what is rightfully called a movement. The movement in the New Testament was altogether different than what we see in CPMs today. While there was no doubt a rapid expansion of the numbers of new disciples resulting in their gatherings and communities of believers, this New Testament movement was characterized by social, economic, religious, and political transformation, which we rarely see in CPMs today, as the focus is often on generational replication of house churches. Undoubtedly, the New Testament movement grew exponentially as more and more believers united on God's mission to see more people worshiping Him. It was not the multiplication of churches, rather, it was the multiplication of faithful Christ followers who were empowered to use their God given gifts. They were inspired to join in hardship and entrusted to keep and to equip others to carry on the mission. And they were reminded to preach the gospel in season and out, and this resulted in God's glorification. Ephesiology, as I state in the first chapter, isn't a commentary on Ephesians. It's not a biblical theology of missions. It's not even a missiology if understood as one of the systems of systematic theology. Instead, Ephesiology is a study of the missiological theology of Paul and John and Peter as they connected the stories of Jesus to the stories of the culture of Ephesus. Ephesiology isn't another method of contextualization, as contextualization attempts to communicate the Bible in meaningful ways to a culture by adapting Bible stories. Instead, Ephesiology focuses on a missiological exegesis that digs deeply in the culture, a missiological reflection that focuses on what God is doing in that culture, And it results in a missiological theology that takes the true, unchanged stories of Jesus and connects them to culture so that the culture sees how Jesus relates to them. God is at work in cultures today. He continues to communicate through His creation, both in nature as well as in His image bearers. That voice is often implicitly revealing His glory just like it did through the Lagos philosophy of Heraclitus of Ephesus 600 years before Paul arrived in that city. And the Zeus found in Erastus' phenomena, as we see in Acts 17. Now, God extends to us the privilege of making him explicitly known to a people who have been in search of meaning. Our current situation with COVID-19 provides us an opportunity to rethink how we are engaging our world, and perhaps Ephesiology can help as it focuses on how the early church connected Jesus' stories to that of, of others. There is a movement of God in the New Testament, no doubt. It's not a church planting movement as it's understood today. It was much more significant, and it connected the story of God to the story of people in such a way that it became the single story of God's relentless pursuit of relationships with his creation. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a five-star rating. For more practical information about engaging culture, visit ephesiology.com. If you are ready to dive deeper, please consider one of our Ephesiology Master Classes. Learn more at masterclasses.ephesiology.com. Until next time, this has been the 10-Minute Ephesiologist.